Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Ben Daly, husband to Kim, dad to Kyla and Cade, lead pastor of Calvary Church, founder of Gospel Institute and Gospel Circle of Churches and Ministries. And somehow I ended up authoring a few books, which is the whole point of this video, by the way. I'm releasing my third book. One day in 2012, I realized I'd been struggling with a condition. Years of performance-based religion and the nagging guilt and shame it produced had made the Christian life a grind. I'd been preaching the gospel, or so I thought, week after week, but something kept me from experiencing the freedom, joy, and love that I described to so many people. Then grace broke in. In this book, I peel off layers of false assumptions and misbeliefs to explain how God's magnificent grace is inviting us out of a dense jungle of guilt and into the freedom of His love. So without further ado, I present my new book, Captured by Grace, Be Free from Fear So You Can Really Live. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see all of you here today. Um, I was told after the first service that um, I needed to introduce myself. Um, I just want you to know that I'm here every Sunday. I never miss. And I preach every Sunday. But it's to your youngins. <laughs> back behind that wall, I'm back there um, every Sunday. My name's Pastor Tim. The kids call me PT, so when they come home, say PT. That's fine. That's fine. That's what my name is. And um, I, we've been here for over six years. We head up the next gen, uh, which is babies through um, high school graduates. And uh, my wife is back there. Your kids are in good hands. My wife, she's Pastor Sassy. Uh, and yes, that's her name. So if your kids come home and say Pastor Sassy, they're not describing her. They really are. Uh, they're not. <laughs> but that's, that's what she goes by as Pastor Sassy. She's back there, and she's teaching your children this morning. And um, But I am so honored to be here this morning, be able to speak to you. Um, thank you to Pastor Brad and Pastor Kayla for giving me this honor. And um, you, got, you saw the blip, the little, um, little video about the book, Captured by Grace. And we're going to go on in this series. If you've been coming right along, you know that we're in the series about Captured by Grace. And we're on to week four, week four of, Victa, of the um, Capture by Grace, and it's actually chapter seven um, for those of you who are reading the book. Now, the cool thing about the book and the, and the series, um, there's going to be some stuff in the book that's not in the series, and then there's going to be some stuff in the series that might not come up in the book. Um, because each of us are individuals, and I, I said that probably um, some of the stuff that I'm getting ready to say this morning, Pastor Ben would be like, uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> so that's okay. Um, each of us have to take ownership of this message, and it's a great book. It's a great series, and I hope that you plug into each one of them the entire time. So today we're on to week four, and this, today we want to talk about victim versus victor. Victim versus victor. And anytime you see the little uh, VS versus, um, that usually means that they are opposing ideas. And indeed, this, today, these are opposing ideas because you can either be a victim or you can be a victor. And I think if you've been around Calvary long enough, you know which direction we're headed with that. Um, because we certainly um, believe in victory and having victory. Um, when I was growing up in church, uh, maybe you were like me, you grew up in church, and you always heard people talking about living the victorious life. And usually, um, it was one of our dear gray-headed saints, and, you know, we were looked at them, and we respected them, and we honored them, and we were like, wow, someday, I want to grow up to be just like that. I want to I grow up to be that um, victorious Christian and living the victorious life. But if we really break it down this morning and talk about it, and actually if we could talk to some of those um, saints that talked about that, really no one has had a 100% victorious time every day, every minute um, of their lives. Yeah. All of us have struggled at some point. Um, all of us can look back and we can say, and maybe, maybe you're going through it right now. Um, it might be a certain temptation that just seems to, to, to get you uh, every time. And, or it might be something that there's an unhealthy distraction that, that, that gets you off of target or gets you off of, of the message or, or, or kind of distracts you from what you know you should be doing. Or maybe it's a fear. Um, about something that's going on in your life and, and fear just wouldn't, it won't leave you alone. Or maybe it's 
Maybe it's a dysfunctional relationship that you're involved in. And you look at those things and you're like, those things are keeping me from living this 100% all the time, every day, victorious life. Well, the good news is we're all in the same boat together. So how can we talk about victory when we're talking about things like temptation and getting distracted and things like that? How can we live the victorious life? Here's the thing. The devil wants to take those issues in your life that we talked about, and, and probably one ran through your mind, and he wants to make you take a victim mentality. He wants to make you feel like, woe is me, I'm the victim. So how do we do away with that? We live in a, we live in a generation right now, and even in the church, a, a lot of people tend to be victims. They, they have the victim mentality. Um, you know, and, and please understand, I'm not saying that, that uh, there aren't real victims out there. There are victims, and, and you may have had a situation where you were truly a victim, and we're not trying to lessen that. Please understand. But um, during all of that, we look at that, and, and there's people out there that they're a victim in every situation. And, you know, every, every time something comes along, they're the victim. You know, I'm, I'm the one. Woe is me. You know, uh, I always used to tease about, you know, their favorite song is the Somebody Done Me Wrong song. And uh, so, you know, it's just always, it's always a victim mentality. Every situation. Now, you probably know somebody like this. No pointing fingers, please. Um, you probably know somebody like this that, that no matter what happens in their life, it's just like they're the victim. They're the victim. They're the victim. There's actually an article online in, a, in an article called Healthline that says there are three key beliefs by somebody who has a victim, victim mentality. The first, first mindset they have is they focus on bad things that happen to them. There's some people that it doesn't matter what happens, you know, it can be raining skitt skittles out of the sky, and they'll be complaining about it. It's, it's always focusing on the bad, the negative. And, and probably if you're a positive person like I am, you just distance yourself from those people. I mean, really. And, and honestly, that's probably the best thing you can do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a positive person. I get up when my feet hit the ground at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm ready to go. I'm positive. I, I don't need a cup of coffee. Need a Diet Mountain Dew, but don't need a cup of coffee. <laughs> but I'm ready to go. The day, is, the day is on. I'm a positive person. I'm always smiling. Miss Kay told me, she says, your smile is just contagious. I like to smile. I like to be happy. I like to be infectious. I, I, don't, I don't want to be around people that are always negative, always looking at the bad stuff. Another characteristic is they blame other people for their circumstances. It doesn't matter what their circumstances is. They've got somebody else to blame. I mean, you know, come on. Look in the mirror. You might have caused your pain. You might have been the reason that that happened. But the victim mentality is like, it can't be me. It couldn't be me. I couldn't have caused my pain. The third, the third characteristic of a victim mentality is there's no point to change because it'll fail anyway. Don't try something new because it's going to fail anyway. So I'm just going to keep going along in my misery and it's okay. That's a victim mentality. Now, victim mentality is not a formal medical term, but it's easy to spot those people. But it's not always so easy to spot it in ourselves. Because sometimes, you know, now... It, this goes without saying that bad things happen. We all know that there are going to be circumstances that happen that are bad things are happening. Dr. James Dobson a few years ago wrote a book called When God Doesn't Make Sense. It was a great book, and it just simply said, look, you know, sometimes the things that happen to you, you can look and say, God, why? And it just doesn't make sense. But what he said was, he said, it's okay to question God's purpose in allowing bad things, but it's never good to question God's love. Because they're not connected. They're not connected. You might have had things happen in your life. You might have lost a job when seemingly you caused no, you did nothing wrong. Um, I had a situation where an employer, 
actually moved me to North Carolina, my, me and my family. He paid to get us down here. Uh, we were living in Delaware at the time, and uh, he paid to move us down here. And um, he told me, he was like, look, we're really excited. You're, you're, we're glad you're on board. And I went in, and I started helping, and I started working with the people. And we started seeing higher, imp higher profits and started seeing the money come in. And while he saw money coming in, of course, I saw some money coming in too. That was a nice thing. And... Um, I'd been there about three and a half months, and he called me back to his office, and he said, uh, Tim, I'm going to have to let you go. <laughs> and I said, why? His answer still sticks to me to this day. He said, I really don't know. <laughs> I'm like, well, thank you very much, you know, and I think part of it was I was getting a little piece of the pie. And he didn't like me getting that little piece of the pie that he, that he liked. But anyway, you know, I could have sat around and really been bummed about that. I remember sitting in my pastor's office at the time, and I was like, I'm unemployed. And he's like, you're what? And I was like, I'm unemployed. And I said, pray for me that I find something else. And God moved us on and, and eventually got us down here. So it's all good. But, but you know, maybe it was that. Maybe it was, maybe it was something that uh, you had an unexpected illness, even though you basically take care of yourself. And, and, and you're sitting there and you're wondering why that, why that happened. Maybe you lost a loved one that just didn't make sense, and, and it was a big blow to you, and, and you, you just weren't ready for that. Uh, maybe you were attacked, assaulted, maybe by a physical, or maybe it was emotional, but, but somebody brought something against you. And, and maybe it was just deep betrayal by somebody that you loved and you had confidence in. Those things happen. Those are bad things that happen. They're legit. They are legit things that happen to people, and we look at them every day. So how do we become victors? Instead of victims, please understand that the gospel has the power to rescue us from the victim mentality, and it instead empowers us to walk in the confidence of the victory that is already ours in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what the gospel is. The gospel takes away that victim mentality and says, look, you are a victor. You're not a victim. You're a victor. That's what the gospel does. And so as we look at that this morning, I want to look at two different things Two realities or giant misunderstandings that we really need to understand. And again, we're going to use the VS, the versus. And the first one is an orphan spirit versus the spirit of sonship. A lot of us are still learning. I'm going to put it that way. A lot of us are still learning what this sonship means. Because there's so much to it. It's so amazing. I mean, Pastor Kayla talked about it this morning. Our songs were talking about it this morning. The, the amazing gift of sonship, we're a son of God. We are the son of Jesus Christ. We have been bought by the blood on the cross. Therefore, that gives us our sonship. You know, all the times I, I see this, and, and I'm, if I point my finger out to you this morning, please understand I got three back at me. Um, but it was, it was so easy to, to forget about this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ and the power that we have and the victory that we have. The victory that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make sure that you understand, too, that when we talk about orphan, I'm not talking about it disparagingly. I'm not putting any group of people down. I'm not, I'm not, they're not less people. In fact, the Bible talks about orphans and actually gives us as a church a higher responsibility to take care of the orphans. It talks about the child, uh, the, the, uh, the um, children that are, do not have parents. And we have an awesome responsibility to them to make sure that they're taken care of. So, so don't think that I'm, I'm trying to run them down. And in fact, um, there's actually some of the very strong leaders that we have experienced over the years have been orphans. And I'm not talking about Orphan Annie, but um, Steve Jobs was an orphan. Our, our first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, would have been classified as an orphan. But I'm just taking some of the characteristics of an orphan and applying them to some of our mindsets that we have. In John chapter 14, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And he said this. He said, look, he had, he had introduced the idea to them that the, he was leaving. But he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. The disciples had no clue what Jesus was talking about. And can you imagine if... And, and I, I, remember, I remember very clearly 
um, losing my mother. It's been eight years. And I remember losing my mother, and, and we weren't prepared for it, and we thought we were taking her home, and the doctor came, and he said, I need to make sure you understand you're not going to take your mom home. And I remember losing her and that feeling of, of wow, I, my mom's not here anymore, you know, that, and a lot of you have experienced that. That's a, that's a terrible feeling. So here's these disciples. They've walked with Jesus for three years and were as close as anybody could be. I mean, three years, they were with him 24-7. And, you know, they were always together. They ate together. They went places together. They were always together. And Jesus said, I'm leaving you. Well, imagine the feeling. Imagine what they felt when they realized that they were going to be left by the man that for three years had poured every bit of his soul and strength into them. He was leaving. But then he said this. He said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not leaving you abandoned. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. And then he said this. This also sounds like a, almost sounds like a riddle. He said, the world can't see me, but you will see me. When I read that, I'm like, okay. Are you talking in riddles, Jesus? Because I don't understand. Do I have special vision where I can see him, but y'all can't? You know, we always do this thing in school. Uh, what superpower would you choose? <laughs> you know, you'd be crazy, amazed the crazy things the kids come up with. But I guess my superpower would be I can see Jesus, but y'all can't. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, look, I'm going, you're going to see me because I'm going to be inside you. The world can't see me because they don't have me inside them. You can see me because I'm inside of you. I'm right here with you, inside of you. So you don't have to look for me. You don't have to be seeing me physically because I'm inside you spiritually. I've given you my Holy Spirit. I'm not leaving you uh, an orphan. I'm not leaving you without a, a father. I'm not leaving you without the guidance that you need. You're going to see me. I'm inside you. And you can put confidence in that. Even in the midst of them really being afraid that they were being deserted, Jesus said, look, I got you. I got you. You're not being deserted. I'm right here. I'm inside you. I mean, how much better could it get than that? So, when I was growing up, I, was, I went to church. Um, I always joked that I was, probably, I was probably the youngest baby to ever go to church because my mom felt like we should be in church. God bless. And... Uh, I, I don't know. Mom's not here for me to ask how old I was, but I'm sure I was not a week old when I went to church the first time. And uh, all through those years of learning, and yet the feeling was, maybe this is a little too good to be true. What happens if? Maybe it's not as good as what it sounds. And that was an that was just a feeling that I had. And, and finally the Holy Spirit came and said, look, let me teach you some stuff about yourself when it has to do with who you are. And I had to learn that, that instead of me questioning people's motives, I could just take that at face value. Because a lot of times when someone paid me a compliment and they said, hey, you know, I love your blue eyes. I don't have blue eyes. I love your blue eyes. And I'd be like, yeah, right, whatever. Because I had an opinion about myself. They would come up and they would say that and I would have a different feeling. See, that's an orphan feeling. That's not a son feeling. That's an orphan feeling. I had to learn that I needed to be um, not, not so focused on beating myself up about what was going on with harsh condemnation. And, and I would always... Like, like when I was by myself, I would, I would be away and I'd be, I'd be beating myself up and I would be critical of myself. And then when I went out into public, I was a different person because I didn't want people to know who I really was. And, and doing away with the comparison thing of, of, of trying to compare and, and always evaluating what I know about myself compared with what I don't know about them. Did you hear what I said? Because when we start comparing ourselves to other people, we're comparing about what we know about ourselves with what we don't know about them. Because we don't know them. I can put on a real good front and go home and cry myself to sleep at night. 
I can, I can make you think that everything's great, everything's good, and there's no problems in this world, and I can go home and have a fight with my wife. So when I start comparing myself to other people, what I'm comparing is I'm comparing what I know about myself with not having a clue about them. I'm just comparing what I think I know about them. That is orphan mentality. We need to get away from that. We need to pull that back. And as we start to grow, we start to see that those, those senses of deep emptiness, those come from that orphan mentality. We don't, we, we don't have a connection that we are the king of, we're the son of the king of kings. We are the child of God. And so our orphan mentality is like, you know, we're not that. I'm, I've got emptiness. I'm, I've, you know, I'm hiding things from people. I don't want people to, to see who the real me is. Because we're afraid that they won't like us. Some of you have been there. Some of you have started getting close with somebody, a friend, and all of a sudden realized that some of those shields were dropping and that they were starting to see some of the real you, and so you cut them off. I've, as a pastor, I've had people come to me and say, I don't have any friends. Yeah, you do. You're cutting them off as soon as they get to know you. They're not there to judge you. They're there to be your friend. And you, as soon as you think that you've let the wall down a little bit too far, you cut them off and push them away. And now they can't be your friend because you cut them off. But what we need to do is we need to realize that we are royalty. When we start doing that, when we start to understand that, we have an increased sense of the Father's love. We start to be confident and secure and boldly creative. We can say like David did in 23rd Psalm that we lack for nothing because of the Heavenly Father. A story that illustrates this is in the Bible where Jesus was teaching. And he might have been getting a little long-winded. Let's see how I'm doing. He might have been getting a little long-winded. And the disciples come up and said, um, hey... These people are hungry. What you need to understand about in the Bible days, the teacher sat and the student stood. See, that's all reversed. Y'all sitting. I'm the one getting tired and hungry up here. Y'all sitting. So we go cut it. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> Jesus is up there and they're like, hey, everybody's getting hungry out here. It, it's time to change something. And they said, we have a solution. Let's send everybody home. Then go home and get lunch, and then then come back, and we'll do series two. And Jesus was like, well, what do we have? And they said, well, there's this little guy out there that has, he has five loaves and two fish. But they, they said, that's okay, we'll put him over in the corner, and he can eat his lunch, and everybody else can go home and get their lunch, and then we'll be all good. See... What they didn't understand is who they were dealing with here. They came to Jesus in their lack, which is an orphan mentality. They had a solution, send everybody home, which is an orphan mentality. And Jesus is like, you're talking to me. Who do you think you're talking to? Interestingly enough, in the Bible, there are 37 miracles that Jesus did. Now, it looked like he did a lot more than that because there's some carryover into the other Gospels. But 37 recorded, recorded miracles. This was number 19. This wasn't number one. It's not like they were like, oh, wow, Jesus can actually do this? Shocker. You know, I can understand that reaction when Jesus turned the water into wine. That was his first miracle. I can understand them saying, wow, who are we hanging out with here? This is number 19. He had already walked on the water. He had already turned the water to wine. He had already proved that he was a better fisherman than Peter. And they come to him and they're like, look, we ain't got no solution. Let's send everybody home. That's an orphan mentality. See, a son mentality would have come to Jesus and said, hey, guess what? We're so excited. We've got five loaves and two fish. You've got to feed 10,000 people out here. How are you going to do it? That's a sonship mentality. A sonship mentality is bringing to Jesus and saying, here's what I got. What you going to do with it? Right. An orphan mentality is like, here's what I got. Sorry, God. <laughs> well, Jesus said, look, we're not sending them all home. 
We're going to deal with this. We're going to handle this. I'd love to have seen that little boy's face. I'd love to have seen his mama's face. I'd love to see his daddy's face when he came walking in with 12 baskets of food. Mom sent him with five loaves. Now, we think of loaves as, you know, like 72 slices of bread. They were probably about that big. Five loaves and two little fish. <laughs> and here came 12 basketfuls home. You know why? We took the five loaves and two fishes and gave them to somebody that could do something about it. They wanted to go home. Jesus wanted to meet the need. See, they thought that the supply was too small because they had an orphan mentality. They forgot that the supply isn't dependent on what you have in your hand. It depends on who you're handing it to. So what do you have in your hand? Don't worry about that. Worry about who you're giving it to. Because if you have a son mentality, it's like, here, God, I, I can't do anything with this, but I know you can. I can't, find, I can't feed 10,000 people with five loaves and two fishes, but I know who can. I can't do anything about my job at work because it's really getting on my nerves, but I know who can. I can't do anything with my sickness because I'm about to die over here, but I know who can. My family is getting on my last nerve. I got one nerve and they're poking it, but I know who can. That's a son mentality. A son mentality is saying, here's what I got. Do something with it. An orphan mentality is, here's what I got. Sorry, God, you can't do anything with it. But how many times do we live there? How many times do we say, wow, I got it tough. This is rough. I don't think I can make it. And God's just like, give it to me. Give it to me. And here's the cool thing. No matter how much of a orphan mentality you have and how much your, your solution is, a mentality, is an orphan mentality, God still has a son solution back in the back. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. He's like, look, I can do this. How easy it is for me to do this. Just let go. Let me do it. Orphans tend to be weak. Because of that mentality. I can't do it. I can't do it. In the contrast, the children of the king are genuinely strong and secure. And secure. If we're going to walk in that victory, if we're going to walk in the victory that sonship brings, we're going to have to turn our back and reject the orphan spirit and rejoice in the spirit of sonship that Jesus won for us at Calvary. So the second misunderstanding, the second misunderstanding is our kingdom versus God's kingdom. We had orphan spirit versus son spirit. Now we have our kingdom versus God's kingdom. And this is all victory versus uh, the, um, the, the battle of, of having a victim uh, mentality. Our, vi our kingdom versus God's kingdom. Peter wrote a book in 1 Peter, and he wrote it to a group of people that were exiles. Now, they were legit exiles. They had a lot of, of oppression. People didn't appreciate their stand. They didn't appreciate the fact that they were Christians. And they were being uh, tormented and abused. And they had no land. They were, they were out on their own. They were, they were like, we, we have no home. We have no home. Here's what First Peter says in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Now, understand this. That's not what First Peter said. This is what I said. Imagine that you don't have a home. Imagine that you've just been kicked out of the country that you called home. Imagine that nobody wants you around. And some guy named Peter wrote you this. But you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not even a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, in their brains, they were exiles, but in their spirit, they were sons of God. 
Peter is calling them to walk in their true identity. We've dealt a lot with renewing the mind and how we need to get the brain in sync with the spirit. And we've had, uh, we've had gospel circles about it. We've talked about it. Pastor Brad speeches about it. That's what Peter's dealing with here. He was like, look, you're living in a land that is not sympathetic to your faith. They don't appreciate where you stand. They don't appreciate the things that you're trying to teach. They don't like you. And you're all considering yourself exiles. You're considering yourself, woe is me, because nobody likes me. But you're not of that kingdom. You're of that kingdom. You're of the kingdom. So my question to you is, does this kind of vaguely sound familiar? As we start to understand kingdom principles, we start to understand that we are not of this world. The old, the old saints used to sing this song, I am not in this world, I'm just a passing through. <laughs> and, and we used to sing that, and we really didn't understand what it meant. But really, this is not our kingdom. That is our kingdom. If this were our kingdom, we've done a pretty bad job of ruling it. So I think that God kind of wants us to ask the same question of ourselves. How can we be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and declare the praises of him who has called us out of this darkness to the people around us? That's what God wants us to do. What do you think we talk about when we're talking about declare and demonstrate the gospel? That's what this is all about. Jesus came to us full of truth and grace, not one or the other, but both. And he calls for us to work in that same, uh, that same glorious reality. Unfortunately, we watch Christians today that disagree with somebody, and they get in a big fight. And God said, Jesus said, you need to love them even when you disagree with them. You need to love them even when you disagree with them. In my dealings with young people, I hear from them that the church has left them and will not listen to them and has just shut them off because they have a new and usually revolutionary idea. And so they go somewhere where someone will listen to them. Now, are they always right? No, not always. But how can we develop a relationship with them when we look like this? They're not going to come to the church when we hold them like this. Brother Ray gave a, a devotional this morning to the Dream Teamers, and it was right along this. I was like, Brother Ray, get out of my notes. <laughs> There's churches that you can't come to if you don't fit certain criteria. And I'm thankful that we come to a church that there is no criteria. Just come on. Just come. Somebody asked me this morning why I hadn't said a certain thing when, when, I, when I quoted a scripture. They said, you stopped too quick. I was like, let's get them saved. Let's bring them in here. Let them experience the love of God. And then when the Holy Spirit's inside them, the Holy Spirit's going to show them all things. But the younger generation is struggling with this. Now, I'm not asking you to lower the standards. Jesus never lowered the standards. Jesus kept his standards where he knew God had them. But he was always showing love. Everybody knew that, God, that Jesus loved them and that God loved them. Too often the church now, we're starting to become the church of the no. Not K-N-O-W, N-O. Because we're really good at telling people what they shouldn't be doing. Now, I know some of you may have come from churches like that. I mean, it's easy for me to, to tell you what you can't do, what you should be doing. I'd rather just tell you about the love of God and Jesus. And if I can tell you about Jesus' love and that God loves you no matter what, then you can analyze that for yourself. Here's how Paul dealt with it in Romans chapter 14. He said, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputed matters. Now, we look at that weak and we think, well, that's somebody that's a new Christian. That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about somebody who actually was very opinionated about their stand. 
And Paul's like, look, if they're your brother and sister, stop quarreling with them. That's my grandma's term. My grandma would say quarreling. She always put a lot quarreling. Quit your quarreling. If we didn't stop quarreling, she got the paddle out. So we quit quarreling real quick. Paul said, quit your quarreling with those that you don't agree with. Now, he goes on in chapter 14, he's in verse 8, he says, If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. We're God's. For this very reason, Jesus died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brothers and sisters? Or why do you treat them with contempt? That contempt is a strong word. For we all going to stand before God's judgment seat. We're all, we're all going to give account. There's some things that are more important than being right. Yeah. Yeah. Ruminate on that for a while. And Paul said, look, we cannot treat people with contempt for what they believe. He goes on in the in same chapter, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul, in this passage, actually was talking back about the Jews had a very strict religious observation that they would not eat meat that was offered to idols. It was a very strong position that, they, um, that the Jews held. The Romans didn't care. If it was food, we gonna eat it. And so... They were, very, they were at odds constantly with this opinion. And Paul's like, look, the kingdom is not about whether you eat meat that's offered to idols or eat meat that's not offered to idols. It's about righteousness and justice and peace. Then he concludes with this that will hit all of us between the eyes. Verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. In other words, he calls all of us to be a peacemaker. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. We still need to live at peace. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. You say, well, how does this have to do with anything? It's God's kingdom. It's the kingdom of God that we're looking at. We're both in the kingdom of God. We've got to be peacemakers. See, that thought is a, that is a total different philosophy from what the world teaches. The world teaches if you don't agree with somebody, then don't speak to them in Walmart. That's that kingdom. That's the earthly kingdom. The earthly kingdom is if you don't like somebody, then you tell them off. God's kingdom is let's be peacemakers. You're God's child. I'm God's child. We've we got to get along together for all eternity. Let's be peacemakers. When Jesus called us to be light, he didn't mean that we had to shine a light on everybody's little faults and failures. When he called us to be the salt of the earth, he didn't mean to be salty in the earth. The problem is when we're talking about the kingdom, we're experiencing more division today, both in the church and in the world, than we've ever seen. I mean, people get their feelings hurt over little stuff and won't speak to people. There's division, whether it's along racial issues or whether it's on political issues or whatever it is. We see more, more divide today than we've ever seen. That's this kingdom. That's not that kingdom. That kingdom, there is no division. That kingdom is there's unity of spirit. I don't have to agree with you to be part of the same kingdom in that kingdom. See, that's, that's totally opposite of the philosophy today. If you and I can't agree, then we can't break bread together in this, in this kingdom. In this kingdom, if we don't agree, then we can't have anything to do with each other. We're not going to hang out. In that kingdom, we can disagree and still get along. And still be brothers and sisters in Christ. And still enjoy and rejoice and worship together. And love each other and be together. Because we're part of a different kingdom. Yeah. Please hear my heart on this. Please stand to your feet real quick. I'm not suggesting that we water down our belief systems. That's not what this is about at all. This is about being victorious. This is about having a different kingdom. This is about not being a victim. Jesus taught love. 
and he showed love. The story that always jumps out to me that I think is so applicable to this message was Jesus was teaching his disciples and they were having a great time together. And the Pharisees came down the hill and they had a woman with them. They threw her down in front of them and said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law says we need to stone her. What do you say? Now understand this young lady laying here in the height of embarrassment, humiliation. Because I don't know whether you understand what it means to be caught in the very act of adultery or not. But it was not a good scene. The, the, the Pharisees wanted Jesus to take a stand. They wanted him to stand for the law. They wanted him to be old covenant. But Jesus didn't take a position. He could have said, shame on you. Shame on you. You're right. She's a sinner. Stoner. Or, he's God. He could have said, it's all right. What she's doing is fine. It's not a big deal. Jesus, in all of that godly wisdom, said, you know what? You who are without sin in your lives come on throw it stoner and then Jesus said woman where's all those guys that have been accusing you she looked up and the Bible says she said to Jesus there is no one and you know when I think about that there's a lot of people out there today that have the rock firmly in grasp they're ready to stone you they're ready to get you now never mind what's in their closet remember the old saying the skeletons in the closet never mind the skeletons in their closet and some of you have experienced that you've had those rocks launched at you you've suffered the looks and the scorns maybe even of some church people that don't understand and may not care to understand. But I've got good news for you. The same Jesus that looked at that woman and told her he loved her loves you. He didn't love her because of what she had done. And he didn't love her because of what she hadn't done. He loved her because he was God. And God loves her no matter what. And you know what? God loves you no matter what. I feel impressed to indifferent this service my elders could come I feel like there's somebody here that you've had the rocks launched at you and you just need you just need somebody to put their arms around you and help you to understand that Jesus loves you 
if that's you this morning, would you come up and just let us show you how much Jesus loves you? It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your past. God, Jesus doesn't love you because of what you've done. He doesn't love you because of what you've not done. He just loves you. And maybe you just need somebody to put their arm around you and say, Jesus loves you. If there's anybody like that, just would you step forward right now and come up to one of our elders and let them just pray with you and pray God's peace on your life. Is there anybody like that this morning? You just need to know that God loves you. God loves you. Holy Spirit, we're so thankful for your faithfulness. And if there's one person here this morning that just needs you to throw their arms around them and love them, I pray that they feel that right now. It's not because of what we've done. It's not because of what we've not done. It's because you love us. And you love us because you love us because you love us. Help us as we start to move toward kingdom thinking that we understand that this same love that you've shown us, we need to show others so that they can experience your love. Thank you again, Lord, for your word. We love you. We adore you. We worship you this morning. We pray that you will go with us as we go our separate ways. For we pray these things in Jesus' name and for your glory. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.